Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome in to episode 13 of Kayfabe Council, a show where we review and critique news topics and segments of the world of professional wrestling. My name is Pretty Tony, and alongside me is TF Joker. Joker, what's the crack, man? What's going on? Oh, it's been a week, PT. It's been a week. Warm. If they lied about how warm it was going to be, it was even warmer. <laughs> I don't know how many times this week I've kind of sat out the back garden and just been like, oh dear, please, just where's the nearest hose? And then it's given nothing but boiling hot water, more hot than the kettle that I used to have my coffee that morning. So yeah, it's uh, it's been one of those weeks. Yeah, we are full-fledged into the dog days of August right now. Many uh, hot days for both uh, yourself in the UK and for me in the States. It's just... Yeah, man. We're uh, honestly at this point. I'm just hoping for fall, brother. Really, so <laughs> give me a little bit more cooler weather. Bring on the pumpkin latte, says PT. <laughs> I'm not about that life. That notwithstanding, sure, bud. that notwithstanding, I don't mind if it got a little cooler, where I might be able to put on a pair of shorts, maybe like a light hoodie or a light jumper. You know, what I'm saying something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. just. When it's, you and I both talked about it, when it gets just so hot, like there's really like not much you can do as opposed mm. to like when it's, when it starts to get cooler, all right, maybe I'll put on a sweater or I'll put on, you know, uh, kind of something else when it gets cooler. But Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like whenever it's nice and cold, like I like the cold weather cause you can put stuff on, you know, you can wrap yourself in a blanket, you can have yourself a little duvet day, but whenever it's, it's roasting hot and humid, you literally cannot, um, you know, remove enough layers to stay cool. It's really annoying. So staying hydrated is obviously the best way. So I have, I have uh, one cold drink and one ice cold glass of water. So, you know, right here in front of me because it's, you know, even though it's the evening, it's still about twenty five degrees, and it's humid, and I'm locked in here with you know a PC that is recycling the hot air. <laughs> so, hundred yeah. percent. 100% as like we said as it gets into hotter days in August as well and as the wrestling heats up definitely remember to uh stay hydrated just take care of yourselves and you know that way you can uh, enjoy your lives enjoy some wrestling and yeah and do all the things appropriated with sort of the end of summer so as we uh celebrating our 13th episode I asked for a 13 but they drew a 31 uh, thank you guys again for the continued support, uh, for listening as well as on all multiple platforms and also interacting with us, but then also checking out the YouTube again. Thank you for the views that we're getting, the subs, and we're continuing to gain some momentum. So thank you so, so much to everyone who's given us a chance. Really appreciate Definitely. it. Brings a big smile to our faces. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, as uh, mentioned before, you can check us out on a video form at youtube.com slash kfabecouncil and an audio form at wherever you get your podcasts from. On this week's episode, we look at more returns to WWE, and we look at CM Punk returning on this week's episode of Dynamite and the implications for what that means going forward and for All Out. But coming up first... More returns to WWE. So firstly, here we look at Monday Night Raw. We had a big return sort of at the end of the show there. So starting off here, um, we touched on a little bit in the previous episode of how back in the end of the 90s and sort of into the early 2000s where Raw and SmackDown specifically would have sort of narrative threads throughout the show sort of a story law a story a show long storyline kind of thread that kind of weaved uh, throughout the show itself so i was actually kind of pleasantly surprised that they kind of actually continued to do that on this week's episode of raw where we had specifically we had a backstage promo where uh kevin owens did, was being interviewed and he's saying his piece after he just had sort of a squash match against uh, Elias's younger brother, Ezekiel. And he's just saying his piece that he's not, he's going to be in control and he's not kind of, you know, this is the new Kevin Owens type of thing and, and stuff like that. But if you look subtly in the background, 
we see what appears to be Dewdrop and Nikki A.S.H. and a couple of, I guess, stagehand or security folks just looking at a wrecked car that appeared to maybe be have smashed into a barrier of sorts in the background. So sort of interesting, very, very subtle, nothing kind of mentioned outwardly. We look at later in the show where we had, again, sort of backstage segment where uh, Alexa Bliss and Asuka are chatting away with Bailey, EO, Sky, and Dakota Kai in the background type of thing. And again, they're sort of in the parking lot slash park, uh, car park. And again, very subtly in the background, we see a little bit of that, uh, the, the aforementioned car, but this time it's being uh, put on a tow truck, so very interestingly enough. And towards the end of that little piece, we get a what appears to be a commotion in the background, and we see someone uh, run past Bliss and Asuka, and then we see uh, what looks like security kind of chasing them. Cut to... The very end of Monday Night Raw, where the uh, finish of the match between AJ Styles and The Miz, AJ is celebrating, and again, we have this sort of interesting kind of camera angle where we have AJ on the left-hand side of the screen, and we sort of are kind of looking into the crowd, sort of the corner of the ringside area, and again, we have this little bit of a commotion. Again, it's not sort of made a big deal, but AJ kind of looks over there, and it looks like we have two security or police officers kind of trying to control a what looks like just a disgruntled person or something of that nature. They get them uh, in handcuffs, and for no apparent reason, they pull off the hood of the uh, person. And it turns out to be Dexter Loomis, the uh, returning Dexter Loomis, of course, uh, known for his time in NXT. So very, very interesting piece. We get AJ kind of looking like, hey, what's going on? We have Corey Graves just very quietly and very subtly just mention, is that Dexter Loomis? So again, not sort of making a big deal, but, you know, kind of a story point to sort of end the show on a little bit of a cliffhanger piece. But uh, yeah, so we have little plot points very subtly jabbed into the entire show. So we'll start us off here with that elongated setup. What was your sort of impression of the sort of reveal of Dexter at the at the end of Raw? Um, so I I have like this sort of love hate relationship with the way they did it because um whenever they normally have anything and you, you see this on live TV a lot like if there's any commotion they try to keep the camera away from that action that's not inherently scripted or you're supposed to be looking at it so you're like okay cool something's gonna happen here uh aj kind of makes a point to look over like well what's going on you see the camera go over and i'm like oh okay so who's who's this because to rewind a little bit i mentioned this to you earlier is like i was writing emails at the time and i was listening to the segment where uh kevin patrick was interviewing uh, kevin owens uh so i wasn't watching it i was just listening and because there was no mention of it, I missed the layup. So everything else past this, I was like, huh, huh, what's that? And then, you know, as I as I went to rewatch it, so like this this reveal was kind of like, oh, what they're arresting somebody? What's going on here? Has that got somebody with the cops that came back? That's Dexter Loon. Oh. So I was like, I was pretty shocked. I was like, okay, this is a kind of a big deal that this is happening after a main event match at the end of the show for a in the background kind of storyline that whenever I went back and I, and I rewatched it because you know I have been able to rewatch shows and enjoy them um it actually made a whole bunch of sense and I liked it I legitimately ended up liking it because it is a story bait to the character that um, I remember watching a match in NXT where he le- he rolled up in a street fight. I can't remember who was in the street fight, but he rolled up and kidnapped somebody and just took them away. I think it was something to do with the Undisputed Elite. I can't remember the specifics of it, but he just rolled up. So it reminded me of that. Maybe. Um, I was just like, 
It may have been Cameron Grimes, because I know they feuded and had sort of like a weird like House of Horrors kind of street fight thing, maybe, perhaps? I think it was before that, maybe after. I remember it being specifically the Undisputed Delete. Okay. Um, because uh, because there was uh, there was something there anyway. Regardless, it just reminded me of him coming in, him being the serial killer, and him having that psycho stare. Just like just the small the small mouth with the wide eyes, with the bleach blonde hair, and you're just like, okay, he's he's got a great look for a psychopath. Um, and uh, yeah, I really really liked it actually. Um, it kind of got lost though. Because the crowd sort of almost had the same reaction I did. It was slow to start. I don't know if you noticed that it was kind of like everybody was interested. They were trying to, you know, people were backing off. They weren't like trying to get in because it was cops doing this. It was, it was like, they looked like not normal security guards, like actual police officers uh, running in and grabbing people. And you saw people pushing other people out of the way, just stay back. Um, so people look legitimately scared, and then all of a sudden, whenever more people got the visage of Dexter, the the cheers went out and the 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 gasps of realization. But I think an awful lot of it was lost because Dexter was, like you said, NXT famous, not me and roster driven. So this might have missed for some people. Yeah, I think there's to your point about maybe it might have slightly missed the mark. You touched on it earlier how if there's things that are unscripted or not supposed to happen, random example, never do it, by the way. But if there's somebody who like jumps the barricade, you know, they're just mm -hmm. like, all right, cameras are not going to show them type of thing and they're going to kind of cut away to a different angle, things of that nature. But they made a cognizant point of like sort of the, the way the cameras were positioned and was like kind of, again, AJ on the sort of left middle of camera was <clears throat> that sort of center of the corner of ringside type of thing. So you're like, all right, obviously this is something. And then obviously you see what appears to be a, a guy like in a hoodie type of thing and sort of people chasing them. So I think it was one of those like more for the TV viewers at home, because if I'm not mistaken, the, they didn't put it sort of up on the Tron. Like it was kind of like, normally it was like, all right, there's kind of a commotion Maybe the crowd sort of turns their head and, and, you know, everyone sort of on TV is like, oh, maybe there's something happening. But we sort of at that point of view, that POV shot of, all right, obviously we're as the TV viewer looking at it. So with the absence of, again, maybe being on a big Tron and kind of thing and and they had they had like other security like, all right, you know, or kind of you know, push it back for safety. Yeah, I mean, I think. I think it was one of those where it's like people are like not explicitly knowing what's going on and then boom, pull the thing off and they see and they're like, oh, OK, it's this guy that I maybe recognize. So, Yeah, I mean, that, that makes an awful lot of sense for the in arena viewer, basically because of even if they were showing it on the Tron you, and you're at the back of the arena, say the back of wherever they are. Uh, you have to be watching this Tron that is however many feet away from you, and the whole the whole reason, even though it is a big TV screen, you're not going to see every little detail, and from some angles, you might not catch even the foreground details. So yeah, I, I do reckon it was more for maybe the the subtleties of the screenshot uh, of the of the framing of the shot rather uh, were probably for us as uh, television viewers rather than the uh, in-house viewers. Um, but I mean, I think that probably isn't so much a... Um, it, it isn't so much a, a factor to blame for not knowing who Dexter Loomis is because nobody would have... Like, that's a narrative thread throughout the, throughout the show. And it's not to know that, oh, yes, that would 100% be Dexter Loomis. It's all, as we put it together, it, it makes sense for Loomis's character as we know who, who he is. Um, I think it's just more, from my point of view, an awful lot of individuals don't watch NXT or have pretty much kept away from it and have missed people like Dexter Loomis um, to that point. I probably don't know who he is. Yeah, I'll, I'll say to that that 
again, he was he was released uh, quite a quite a bit ago last year, if I'm not mistaken, or very early this year. So it's one of those he's, he's been away from the company for let's just say uh, for absence of of fact at least sort of six months, maybe mm-hmm. uh, maybe all the way back to January, if not earlier. So we have folks that are kind of like wasn't wasn't like NXT champion, kind of like sort of suit a big deal, but he did get a lot of sort of storylines and kind of story beats for those that are again familiar with NXT. But he wouldn't be one of these things where like if you had, you know, a Cody Rhodes come back and you're like, oh, I recognize this person maybe because of how they've been portrayed throughout various places and, and various storylines. So I think it's it fits his character, his sort of like kind of creepy sort of serial killer stalker type of character for it to be like sort of subtle and him to be kind of like a little bit kind of crazy and, and things of that nature. But I think it was one of those maybe to the point of a little bit more of a shock value piece than it was to be like, oh my God, like Cody or, or The Rock or Stone Cold's coming back, you know, like sort of that huge arena sort of pops kind of cliffhanger piece. So again, makes sense for his character, but for those that may not be hugely familiar with an NXT or to a lesser extent, uh, TNA or Impact, yeah, they may not just be like, who is this guy? So either yeah. way, I think it's going to spark interest regardless on two varying degrees. Yeah, yeah. No, it, like, regardless of what they set out to do, my initial point was about the initial reaction. And that was pretty much everybody going, oh, okay, cool. And that's the way it was framed. And every single thing I've seen about the reveal of him, like 100%, it is to his character. This character is not somebody who is supposed to come in and seek the spotlight. He's supposed to be in the act of getting caught doing something. He's supposed to be that uh, sort of psychopath, stalker, killer, hunter kind of person. Um, So yes, it was definitely to his character. What wasn't to his uh, benefit was the fact that no one knew who his character was. That's really where the um the, the point the point getting across to, and that was the unfortunate thing, because like you said, he has been in in decent story beats in NXT with people like you're saying like Cameron Grimes with uh, back in the uh, undisputed era, uh, and uh, then you have he even was in a, a bit of a feud with uh, Johnny Wrestling Johnny Gargano, um, so like it's not as if he wasn't sort of uh, prevalent in NXT. It's just people will get to know who Dexter Loomis is, and this was a really good way to frame the psychopath, uh, because he we we talked we actually talked about it a, a few weeks ago or was it last week? If everybody is presented the same, it's boring. This guy is presented completely different from the Carrion Cross debut last week or re debut, sorry, uh, return whatever you want to call it. Uh, the Carrion Cross. Um, build like his presentation is different to roman reigns drew and now you have somebody completely different yet again like i know people don't like the spooky stuff or the weird stuff but honestly if you don't have these sorts of things it all gets kind of stale because they're all really good athletes they can all do essentially the same stuff if you don't have characters in this show you're not really going to have a show for very long because it's just going to be the same thing for three or four hours 100 percent that that is that has been really good in these last couple of weeks that we have seen a different presentation and this can only go up for dexter i think i'll agree with you wholeheartedly you know harkening back to the previous episode we talked about to the point we both made about we need it's a variety show and and having different presentations and different looks and different feels and different themes work to that and then the i believe the point that i made last week about the old Paul Heyman ECW trope of working to people's strengths and hide the weaknesses. We have, it works. We're trying something a little different. And like we've mentioned again, now that it's sort of working to his sort of character, how he's been portrayed or kind of how his presentation. So a little something different. We saw a different surprise return with Carrion last week, like you had mentioned. So a little bit different, uh, coat of paint or, 
presentation on the Bailey return at SummerSlam. So, you know, we're working sort of with different elements, but we're still getting to that finish line of, okay, we're, we're having them come back or we're having them being debuted or return or being presented. So I think, however, I do like the nature of we're, we're getting to the finish line, but we're taking a different route. And that kind of mm. helps, su- helps support and kind of works to maybe their strengths or gives them an opportunity potentially to succeed with kind of what, how they're portrayed and kind of what they work with. So I do, I do agree that um, maybe not everyone was like, Oh, it's not the huge, like lift the roof off the arena moment, but it was like, all right, cool. Like it's probably going to work to benefit him. Yeah. There's definitely no perfect way to, uh, to book a show. Um, like it's not always gonna be an absolute stonker of a show, uh, but these reveals, these returns, uh, and even some more returns, they have all hit the mark, um, because of their leaning into that decent presentation. Like you said, with Bailey, she came out, she was still hail Bailey, love it by the way, and then she just comes up and she has that big smile on her face, and you know, she introduces the other two and they walk the ring, she's acting cocky, it's great, love it, love to see it absolutely give me more of it and then you have the big shock reveal of the monster man who is carrying cross he has to come in and be a powerhouse he has to come in and make shock entrance because he's supposed to be violence and he's supposed to be uh this this sort of big guy who's coming in and then you have the sort of criminal uh dexter loomis who maybe is getting caught trying to break in and well who's he after you know like you can't just have him come in so who is dexter loomis after do we think because that could lead to more returns yeah so i do like the the nature again of like all these different things it just adds intrigue at the end of the day if you're familiar or you're not familiar like oh who's this person who's this dexter loomis person who's this carrion cross or the scarlet person or the the two other folks, the EO Sky, the Dakota Kai's that came along with Bailey. So it's, yeah, definitely it adds the interest and it sparks potential eyes on the product. So yeah, I think it's, yeah. I think it's good. And just to add a little bit of a rumor as well. Uh, well, not so much a rumor as previous experience uh, shown like last week and whatnot, whatever it was, there was a, uh, a sort of inside the ropes, Johnny Gargano was doing a, a sort of, meet and greet and little talk little talk segment and Dexter got up on the stage with him, sat down and just sat and read a magazine. So, you know, they are still quite close outside of wrestling. So I would love to, you know, just throw that little rumor out there, you know, st- stir that about. Yeah, work in the marks, work in social mm. media, planting seeds. There's nothing wrong. I mean, even before social media was really prominent, uh, you know, Workers have been working the marks and the fans ever since, so for sure. But in terms of the past couple of weeks under the Triple H regime, some of the things that I've noticed for, and I mentioned it very briefly in last week's episode, is sort of the, again, the narrative thread that we saw specifically this past week on, on Raw, that segments themselves feel less isolated. And they feel like they're flowing into one another. So I was thinking about the, the Bailey Collective, right? At the end, after their piece of talking to Alexa and Asuka, they end up sort of walking backstage. They pass by AJ, who's then getting ready for his match against The Miz. You know, we talk about on SmackDown, after Karrion cross cuts his promo, we pan over and he's always looking at Drew and his music hits and then he cuts his, uh, and then he goes into the ring. Ronda making her return on SmackDown. She happens at the end of that segment, passes and walks by and has a quick conversation with Shayna Baszler, but then bleeds into the next segment of her and doing the contract ch- signing with Liv Morgan. Sammy appearing a couple different times with the Usos and that Drew storyline sort of that, that navigated through SmackDown. So again, I like the fact that it's not like, all right, cut to the announce desk. We're going to read some things. All right, instantly cut to a backstage promo. Uh, and interview, cut it off, cut to commercial type of thing. Like, again, it sort of makes it feel like the backstage area is sort of alive. 
that they actually interact or you'll actually see people type of thing. So it feels less rigid. Again, there's sort of a bit of fluidity. It helps actually kind of make it feel like it's not like segment, 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 where it's like, again, it flows better is kind of the point that I'm driving at. And it actually feels a little bit more real, like almost like more like a, like a sort of sports, uh, presentation or a show rather than sort of like a hyper regulated television show yeah no i 100 percent agree uh because like having the show feel alive like as it does now can only benefit the viewers because you get to see that uh these segments aren't just all um cut off from each other wrestlers aren't aren't corralled into catering while we do other segments with other people in other places. You know, there are people allowed to roam around and you got to see like with the, the carrying cross, like he's cutting that promo and he's not doing, he's not screaming. He's being a little bit loud, but you know, you can sort of hear the din of the crowd and it, uh, as they, you know, as he kind of looks over and the, the camera pans across, you see Drew there, like you said, going out to his match. It's like, well, you know, he could have heard that, but he didn't because, and it makes sense to you that the crowd was making noise, you know, or he was being just quiet enough, you know. So it adds to Carrion's character, it adds to what Drew's doing, and it feeds into each other. And then you have, like you said, the um, Alexa Bliss and the Asuka promo uh, talking to the, the guards of control. Uh, definitely don't put on your narrative on there. But then they walk past AJ and he's just kind of fixing himself. He looks at them, they kind of go, you know, kind of walk past them, don't really, they don't really do too much. Uh, and then he just kind of walks out to the ring. It's like, it feels like these, these guys and girls in the, in the back are allowed to interact outside of segments that are scripted. And like you said, it, it breathes life into the show. It makes it feel more organic. It means that these guys uh, can, uh, possibly get up to anything and it makes those run-ins a little bit more interesting because whenever you just have a random run-in it makes no sense like why are you doing this oh because i had a segment 45 minutes ago at the start of the show where i said i was going to do something and now i'm doing but you don't know what the setup to this segment was i'm just doing it because i was told i'm doing it whereas like you said we have the uh uh, we have the Ronda Rousey come in, dump a bunch of money, you know, be hail Ronda. Kudos to that. Great stuff. Walk past uh, the incoming Shayna Baszler. Make a passing comment like, oh, you used to be you used to be such a killer as as Shane is trying to, you know, promote. And they don't have a microphone in their face. This is not a promo. This is getting caught as they're walking past each other. So it's, it's very light on the microphone. And then you hear Shayna, you know, say that you're supposed to play by the rules you're supposed to do this that, and the other it's like you used to be such a killer like and then you know shana kind of has that we put a face on her and then she goes into the next segment that you know leads in with with Liv calling her ronda light saying that i beat the real thing and you can just see the cogs this is what trips wants trips wants us to see that shana is turning back into uh, nxt shana and we are going to see this absolute killer come back because at the minute she's been neutered. And you can't just have the flip switch, or the switch flip, rather, not the flip switch. Um, you can't just have that happen because it makes no narrative sense. But to see this, again, just brings life to the show, life to the characters, and makes it an all round better show. You mentioned the little piece about Johnny Gargano and Dexter, right? Just that little piece that you mentioned randomly off show. And it's really about planting seeds. Like previously, mm -hmm. you'd think about the kind of old way to do it. And I brought up the example, like cut to the desk. All right, we're going to throw to a backstage interview. And that was kind of it. And it felt like it was almost as if these characters appeared and maybe weren't allowed to interact or even talk about or even see other people. There are other coworkers that they worked with type of thing. So the couple examples of, again, we have the, the stuff going on behind Kevin Owens in that interview, the 
folks running past Alexa and Asuka, you know, Bailey and her crew walking past AJ kind of thing. And just, you know, maybe it's a look or the, the piece about Shayna and Rhonda. They shared some words that were picked up on the the camera's microphone as opposed to the microphone where everybody can hear. So it's one of those things, again, we're planning little details or we're type of thing you're making potentially later on down the road. You can make callbacks like, oh, the nature of, you said, just the random flipping of the switch where it sort of potentially can feel disconnected. You know, if they're just like, oh, this random person comes in for a beatdown, you're like, well, why? What does this make sense? But if we see maybe we're the fly on the wall and be like, oh, I happen to watch that little interaction they made. Oh, I'm connecting pieces to this now. I feel more invested. I feel like I understand. I feel like I'm kind of, oh, like I know this thing, but maybe not everyone didn't who even watch it or didn't watch it knows what's going on. So again, feels more live, feels a little bit more organic. You know, it, these things like can happen. So I, uh, I'm, I'm okay with it. It's being presented different and I'm, I'm digging it. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, pointing to the fact that you need to be paying attention to not just what's being said, but what's being shown. Um, and for someone who for the longest time really had wrestling on in the background, um, and kind of watched for a while, enjoyed what I watched, waited for something that I wanted to enjoy to happen. And then I would listen to interviews, listen to segments, you know, listen to whatever was going on. Cause I wasn't really interested in what was going on the screen. Cause all they were doing was talking. Well, now I have more of an interest in, well, I might miss something. I might miss a walk past. I might miss an interaction in the background. You know, it, feeds into maybe wanting to pay a little bit more attention and maybe finding out something else that could happen. 100% kind of those little Easter eggs or those little moments that were not explicitly being shoved down our throats, but yeah, we can kind of see and piques interest. Maybe gets mm -hmm. uh, folks to watch and be an active watcher. With that, speaking of kind of surprises and kind of being after, being trying to get more eyes on the product, we had another return here. On SmackDown, we had Hit Row return as we saw uh, Shot Kala, uh, B Fab, as well as uh, Adonis come back and end up having a tag team match against the, excuse me, Top Dollar, uh, B Fab, and Shanti the Adonis come back on SmackDown and then ended up having a match against the uh, sort of local talent. But yeah, I think that was more of a showcase for them to. Have a little bit of a match, but then the the post-match promo of them again just sort of reiterating that we're back. The OG3 are here again. And uh, yeah, so we had quite the crowd response to, uh, to them. And uh, for those that aren't uh, aware that they were a team in NXT and uh, they ended up uh, more famously kind of fighting with Legado del Fantasma. And then they were brought up to the main roster in October of 2021. And they had a, a bit of a run there and then ultimately ended up getting released about a month later in November of 2021. So unfortunately, they didn't have quite a long run on the main roster, sort of had their legs cut out from underneath them. But yeah, it was actually a, at least in the arena, a fun kind of actual response. And the crowd seemed to get behind them, especially too, even on their post-match promos. So what were what were your impressions when you saw Hit Row uh, re-debut or return on SmackDown? Who? Hey. That was legitimately my response. Okay. Um, for someone who, and this this is not a knock on Hit Row. Okay, I didn't watch a lot of NXT uh, circa twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty two, like the start of the year. Uh, and whenever the 2.0 happened, the repackaging and stuff hasn't made me want to watch it. It doesn't interest me. The storylines are kind of whatever. And Hit Row was in that sort of area of, um, well, I'm not really interested. In. Like, even at the very end with Johnny Gargano's The Way faction with um, his wife, uh, Candice, uh, you had Indy Hartwell in there and you had... Um, the the then austin now just theory theory um you know you had a couple of decent people in there 
what I still didn't want to watch, didn't make me want to watch. So whenever these uh, these individuals came out, I saw them and I was like, oh, it's Hit Row. Why? Oh, you're back. Okay, cool. Um, why? What's going on? And then they had the squash match. And then they had the promo where it was like, if you don't know who we are, or if you don't know, now you know. Is that what they said? Yeah, of course, that being famously a Christian Cage TNA reference. If you don't mm. know, now you know. So, Well, there we go. Um, you know, I really didn't know. And now I know something a little more. But I still don't really know an awful lot. Because I don't really remember their names. Like, you, you, said, you said their names like two minutes ago. So I, I remember what they're called. They just, I'm one of the people that didn't hit for it. And the only reason I remember them is because I remember them getting released. And I remember seeing them on the main roster and doing what, um, doing what the Street Profits did. They were doing little advertisement spots. Yeah, uh, they had these kind of, they had these like sort of unique promos that were featured on different locations, like in studios and things like that. So they, yeah. They themselves had a different presentation and kind of a different feel to them, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, like, this was the group that had Swerve Strickland in it, of, of now AEW fame, right? That is correct, of course. Yeah, so. yeah. So, like, they had this sort of group that seemed good, you know, looking back at it and looking at the information and going, okay, this information's been presented to me. As a critical thinking adult, I can go and look this information up and find out and see what see what was going on. So I know who Hit Row are now, but when it happened, I didn't know what was going on, why people were even bothered with this, and why I should be bothered. So I went and looked it all up. I went and had a look, and they have a unique um, they have a unique kind of flow to them. They're not like anybody else on the roster currently. And if they had have stayed as four individuals with like the tag team, then you had your then you had your female star who could run run that gamut of of um of the championship, and then you have your single star, and then you have your tag team in there. Like you know, it's a really good core group, and I really like that idea. But I don't know what way they're kind of going to be set up now, because as much as we are sort of singing the praises of Triple H. Uh, currently, uh, for some people, bringing back prestige to the mid card titles, which I kind of have a little bit of a sort of thing with, but that's for another day. Um, like he's not putting an onus on the tag team titles or the tag division, unless you're con- you're you're talking about the women's tag team uh, tournament that we have currently. So adding an adding another tag team in there kind of muddies the waters. Um, and it didn't feel like it had any pomp or circumstance to it. I just kind of felt like it was pushed in there. So this, to me, was not a big return. This was more of a, we're sliding this in here because we know they're popular. We'll get a reaction, and it'll be good, and it'll keep the show going. There's a couple different points that you hit on uh, here that one of the things that you'd mentioned that because you maybe had a disconnect with NXT and then their subsequent turn into NXT 2.0, you weren't as familiar with them and their kind of run. And then again, with them being brought up to the to SmackDown and then being subsequently released roughly a month or a month and change after sort of their debut, again, they got their knees, take, they got the legs taken out from under them. So you may have only potentially been aware of them for a short amount of time and didn't really get enough opportunity to kind of kind of see what they were about and kind of all these different things so that's that's going to happen with a lot of folks with again to your point about not being familiar with them from nxt or there so they might have been a little bit more known again for kind of what sort of happened off off screen or off show with them kind of defab the the young lady being released first literally after signing a contract a week before she got released, a bit actually a long-term contract, which is confusing in itself. Uh, both uh, Top Dollar and Shante Adonis sort of sticking up for them, like, "Hey, what 
you know, why, why would you, why would you release her after you get leg legitimately gave her contract type of thing? Essentially that rubbed the wrong way. And then them getting released. So it was kind of, there was sort of some conjecture there, but again, I think their, their piece was more of, they just really didn't have an opportunity to kind of show to the sort of a grander stage and to people sort of what happened. So I can understand how that can sort of miss the mark or not feel like a big return type of thing. So I can, I a hundred percent sort of see your point. And then you made another point about how we are having a, a little emphasis. You specifically pointed to the tag team division. So we're getting a piece about the women's tag team championship and it having a tournament and kind of actually being shown to important. I, I'm not mad or actually I'm okay with, and I'm glad that they're adding another tag team because a lot of times you had seen, uh, I point to the Randy Orton, Matt Riddle thing where you just put two singles people together and now they're a tag team type of thing. So I, and we joked about it before. I was like, Oh, at the next pay-per-view, the clash at the castle, like, I'm sure there's going to be a tag team championship match. Oh, it's going to be the Usos versus the Street Profits because there ain't much else kind of going on or there ain't much available. But that's so, what I mean, PC. So. Like, there's nobody else in that division aside from the Usos and the Street Profits and then the New Day who are warring with the new Vicious Viking Raiders. Like, those are the only four teams. They're not connected. They're on different shows, apparently. And you're just like you're adding in another you're adding another uh, SmackDown tag team, and they're fighting they're getting a squash match, like I, it, it's it's sort of a disconnect for me because there's no emphasis on the tag division. It feels like even though Jimmy and Jay are holding it down, they are enforcers for Roman Reigns, head of the table, the Big Goose, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down the line, and it's not like even though they're the undisputed tag team champions, like adding in our tag team will just like the singles title, we don't really have titles for you to fight for because they're stuck on these these other people. So that's kind of what I'm trying to get towards with adding in another tag team. We need the prevalence of a tag team division to be apparent before we can kind of get behind another tag team, in my opinion. We had mentioned previously that with the change of management from VKM to Trips, that there wasn't going to be like sort of huge, monumental, impactful things happening right away. It was probably going to happen incrementally. There's going to be sort of kind of small changes and things of that nature. Where I'm going with this is we're seeing, we've seen a little bit of like, all right, now the United States, the Intercontinental, it, titles are being shown to be all right they're not important they're not just some random kind of trinket okay we we want to make them feel again how they were previously we're seeing with the women's tag team division type of thing like that i feel like with now being adding some tag teams now you have one actual team again with the, the hit row piece being there um, with potential more returns to come because apparently there's conjecture about Trips is not is he's got his foot on the gas and he wants to again kind of put that put that piece and kind of sort of get back to where we were so we don't have six months of the new day facing off against the Viking Raiders or before that the new day versus the Usos because there just wasn't type of thing like that adding more legitimate teams or adding this piece again we can get away from those rematches and I think as potentially we'll see then the tag team division, I feel like can get there once again, like we're trying to do with the US title, like we're trying to do with the Intercontinental title, like we're trying to do with the, the women's piece. So again, my point would be it may have potentially fell flat, but having another team is that again can be featured on TV that we can cycle in and out and less rematches. I, I feel like it, it can definitely help that division to get to where it needs to be. I don't disagree, but my point to it is these strokes are too broad to be featured on TV when we're trying to narrow the focus on specific things to bring us towards uh, the small stepping stones. Because like I said, you can't just make you can't just make huge sweeping changes. You can't do that. It's not smart, it's not gonna work. 
So him adding in these little pieces, I agree, is good. But in a world where you have Omos having to have squash matches because, well, we need to build him up away from taking away from the stars that we also need to build up, I don't see where a returning team coming in and getting a squash match is anywhere on the level of someone who's supposed to be a monster getting a squash match. So to me, them having a, a run-in segment, a statement segment, rather than a squash match, personally would have been the better uh, showcase for them, regardless of whether or not it suited uh, the the episode. It shouldn't have been this way, in my personal opinion, because like I said, this, the, the division just doesn't work right now. The division is not the showcase. It's like the, 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 the men's tag team division is not a showcase for the shows that are currently going on. There are tag teams. There are rivalries. We are trying to build the prestige for these mid-card titles in the intercontinental and U.S. while we distract people with the shiny lights away from the fact that Roman's again not at work. And then, you know, one day we'll have these these clear lines between the singles division and the the tag titles, and they won't be on, you know, all these titles won't be on three individuals, for example. And then it'll feel like, well, Hit Row has a reason to exist. They have a reason to be a dominant force in the tag division, just like the New Day, who haven't been around those titles in a few years now. Uh, Street Profits could do for a break, let's face it. They have done the last four or five shows with the Usos. Sorry, boys, I'm a little bit sick of it. And then, you know, you have the new Vicious Viking Raiders. They can go in after it. You can have everybody else, whatever tag team. But we need to build that division up again because the joke from the Young Bucks is that, that, that WWE just doesn't like tag team wrestling. From FTR as well. Like, they don't like tag team wrestling over in WWE. And yeah, you could you could make that assumption that that is the case. So I think that here we need to take it slower. We need to build the division up alongside these mid card titles. And this team, in my opinion, wasn't big enough in the beginning to just warrant a squash match return. Should have gotten a more of a big deal return if you want to make them a big deal. Yeah, I felt like the. The notion of having them sort of be a surprise return to get that little bit of, again, of a surprise. I think it was more so suited towards the, them more cutting the promo and mm-hmm. also happened to featuring like, all right, hey, here's a little bit of a, a couple moves type of thing. Because again, it was just a quick match. So again, we want them to shine, but we don't want to sort of take away from anybody else. So mm-hmm. throw a couple local talent in there, boom. But again, it was more so that, um, if I didn't time it, but it was probably more so that the the promo and the quote unquote match had probably the same amount of time. So oh, again, yeah, yeah. yeah it's just, it's a segment to segment to reintroduce them really at the end of the day, but I'll agree again, mm-hmm. um, put them in. We'll, we'll build, uh, you know, trip spawn them back for a reason. We'll build them. Oh, yeah. We'll build them to have folks again, have them feel important and uh, we'll get that division. So where, it'll kind of be where it's just like, all right, it's not, all right, it's not the bathroom break because it's a tag team match type of thing, but yeah. Eventually, that, that is my eventually. point. Like the, the segment just wasn't the right segment. Like they, they missed the mark on the segment. Like it shouldn't have been that. It shouldn't have been a 30 second match for a 30 second promo. It should have been a one minute promo. It literally should have been a bigger statement. Um, it, Cause at the end of the day they came in and it was like, Oh, it's hit row. I'm like, okay, cool. So. It's another tag team. Big guy. Svelte guy. Do your job. I got a promo out of it. Cool. No. Not every, like we talked about, the presentation of these kind of different returns and type of things. Like, ideally, we'd play to their strengths and sort of uh, hide the weaknesses type of thing. And, you know, they can they can cut promos and they can be charismatic on the mic and type of thing. And, you know, obviously, we'll see as they kind of get back integrated on the show and get maybe a little bit more reps when we will see more from them for on the matchups and things like that but we'll uh, we'll see how things go forward with them so i can only hope because honestly it didn't 
hide any weaknesses or raise any strengths of theirs. It just kind of showed weaknesses of the back room where he's trying to do an awful lot and may have missed the mark on these guys having a return. So that's the only thing. It's it's not a, a knock on hit row. It's a knock on their presentation. Um, but at the game, again, this return fell the flattest of flat for me personally. Fair enough. Um, as we look at, again, all these returns and kind of these reintroduction and presentation, we think about... Man, trips. Triple H is wasting no time, and kind of having these little tweaks and kind of doing these returns and things like that, and sort of those Triple H guys and gals getting on TV, getting pushes, kind of being presented a little bit more prominently and differently. We think about Champa. You know, he went from just being sort of the Mrs. Heater to now being presented. Won a triple threat match, ended up beating AJ, had a very strong competitive match with Bobby Lashley. You know, Bailey being, have a large and sort of important return, and obviously the being paired alongside EO Sky and Dakota Kai. Kevin Owens feeling important, having that promo, looks like he's getting a push. You know, Ricochet being back on TV, that's awesome. Shinsuke getting a, a main event matchup against uh, Gunther on SmackDown. So it's looking like folks that have been quote-unquote Triple H guys and gals, like, again, like they're they're being pushed and getting a little TV time. So good good on them for sure. Yeah, I, I can't really say enough good things about it because um, at the end of the day, all of these matches that we're seeing with these individuals are different matches. Like they're different matches with different people. Under VKM, we were seeing rematches every week. We were seeing the same segment played out every week with different with different people sometimes, but the same results. A, a good uh, indicator of that would have been the Lacey Evans versus Aaliyah non-match. For three weeks, I think we were trying to get that match off the ground. You know, Lacey Evans keeps coming out and saying, no, you're nasty, and then walking off. Like, okay, cool, you're supposed to be babyface, but then you were supposed to be on a different show, and then you're a heel babyface, heel babyface, and you're gone, because you're injured. Cool. Um, so, having the fact that we didn't have a segment with the Bloodline in the main event, wow. Like, SmackDown finished with an Intercontinental title match. What's that about? Like, yeah, cool. the, the nature of that title feeling important when it hasn't been defended on a pay-per-view since literally early last year so in the in the wrestlemania pre-show or whatever it was with big e and something uh, of that nature. It, was, it was it was it was ridiculous like it has not been defended on a pay-per-view in over a year it is stupid um and i think even ricochet uh holding the belt he wasn't even on TV for two, three months while holding the belt. Basically. Um, so, I mean, yeah. And, and they have... This is where I have a little bit of annoyance with it. They call it the workhorse title. And Ricochet is a former title holder. And he won it and then never really defended it. And uh, this is not a knock on Ricochet because he is a really good talent. This is a knock on the booking of this title. Like... I feel like they need to address how it hasn't been the workhorse title, but it needs to be brought up. And I feel like these will add to the titles because people look at these and go, these are meant to be prominent. And these are the individuals that do it. You have your Champas, you have your Bailey's, you have your Kevin Owens, and your Ricochets, your Shinsuke's. Like, these are the guys and girls who need to make these deals bigger than they are. Like we said before, Ciampa um, loves the belt. Like the NXT title, he called it Goldie, and he, the presentation of him running, to, you know, walking to the ring, being sadistic as the black heart, just holding, like clutching the belt. Like you knew whenever you saw Tommy Champs with that belt that that belt meant something. And if he was to hold anything, his presentation, boom, I'm holding this belt. This is the new Goldie. You know what I mean? And then you have uh, 
the only real reason that it is sort of building to prominence for me is that you have Bobby Lashers and you have Gunther um, walking out and hold, like having the, these these belts around your waist. And even at the end of the, the main event there, you had Ludwig uh, put the belt around Gunther. Like, that was good. I like that presentation um, because there was a few weeks, about a month and maybe some change, where I was complaining about um, Randy and Riddle just chucking their belts on the ground. Like, that's to me is not presentation of a of a big title belt. That is like this is trash on the ground. Uh, so these guys and girls need to make me believe they want it, not through the matches, them like which will ob- obviously be amazing because they're all amazing athletes, but through how they interact with the belt itself. I agree, and um, these little tweaks that Triple H seemingly is making with. Less rematches, little different things, different presentations, again, that we spoke about previously. All these little different things, again, we talked about incremental changes as opposed to like sort of whiplash, very sharp changes. I feel like we're, again, moving into a good direction and moving into sort of positive things for more folks around as well. So I'm I'm liking what we've seen and, and I'm hoping for more continued pieces going forward yeah no i'm I'm the same really enjoying what i'm seeing with some individuals and uh well may continue all right so those were the returns for a wwe uh definitely let us know how you thought the returns of dexter loomis and the returns of hit row and the different uh presentations around these other folks as well have been going let us know in the comments down below on youtube or on twitter and instagram All right, moving over to the other big return that happened as well, CM Punk returning on Dynamite. So we saw this happened and the main event of uh, Dynamite this past week, post matchup between John Moxley and Lionheart Chris Jericho. We see the match ending and then, of course, uh, Moxley retaining the JAS coming in to interfere and beat down on Moxley and then his compadres in the Blackpool Combat Club come in alongside uh, Ortiz and Eddie Kingston, so kind of a big schmoz and lots of fighting in the ring, and then all of a sudden, Cult of Personality hits, and the man himself, the world heavyweight champion, CM Punk, comes down to clean house, gets rid of the JAS, and then we see the two men in the ring by themselves, Moxley, of course, kind of pushes off. And he goes, the, I'm good. I'm good. They do the face-off. They do the uh, sort of Rock Hogan look opposite way. Okay, and then we switch. I'll look the other way type of thing. Crowd's going crazy again because Punk has returned. Obviously, John Moxley is a big favorite. Just coming off a uh, huge match with Chris and then the sort of schmoz in the ring and the big kind of beatdown. And then, boom, looking at each other, and then, bam, flips the bird to CM Punk, because John doesn't care. So, hot dang, crowd was really, really responsive again for the just the showdown and the, the Punk return, so I'll throw it over to you. What was your impressions, what were your just thoughts on the sort of surprise return of CM Punk? Um, I, f- I feel like I'm just going to be the bad guy today like i don't know what kind of mood it is i'm in but i'm, I'm definitely going to be the bad guy it's hot outside so you're not ah, feeling good yeah it's hot we'll blame it on it being hot for me thinking like this no go away cm punk didn't like it go away why what is this what is this what why what are you doing go away what is no that is legitimately the things I was saying as he was coming down to the ring. I was like, oh, I knew it was coming. The rumors were there. Everybody was like, oh, punks are trying to run, punks are trying to run. I'm like, I am not, nor have I ever been a big punk fan. I, I will make no bones about it. I am not a, a punk fan. Um, not because he's not a good person. Like, I think punk as a person, you know, what I've seen on the internet, what I've seen from interviews and things like this, he is a genuinely lovely person. Um, but I am not a punk fanatic. And that is how I describe a lot of his 
uh, you, a, lot, a lot of his supporters, they are fanatic. Like fan is the shortened term of that word, but you know, they just bring it to a completely different level. They lose their minds. I don't care. And this to me reeked of we need to bring Punk back to show that he's here, to show that he is coming back, and to make sure that people know that this Jericho thing is over by putting the relevant um, next opponent in front of John. It took away from the strengths to that harken back to you know the uh the previous points about um which is funny because Paul Heyman uh, making these comments where you know you know, show, shine the strengths and then hide the weaknesses. CM Punk being a notable Paul Heyman guy, um his strength is on the mic. Like his strength is on the microphone and you didn't give him one. You had him walk out there do this and then walk that was it like john moxley's strength isn't on the microphone he's good but his strength is in the ring and his visceral sort of actions and that double finger to uh to punk was a much better presentation of the strengths of a character than having you march out a gimped punk to stand there and take it uh, without a belt. Because he is the AEW champion. John is but the interim. Where was Punk's belt? Where was Punk's microphone? Where was the segment where Punk should have buried him? Oh wait, it should have been on next week's Dynamite. Not here. It was so bad. I don't disagree with the points that you made. I think you you've mentioned it before, just even in passing. Like you're you're not the sort of hugest CM Punk fan, which I think is is good because we get we get like for me, you know, I I kind of dig his vibe. I think it's cool. Like I can totally understand why folks are connected with him and kind of that sort of you know I'm not the sort of poster boy. I'm not the ideal kind of look. You know, I can talk. I, I the uh, proverbial speak for the voice of the voiceless type of thing and kind of have that that swagger and bravado and uh, you know, he wrestles different style as well. Um, and then, you, you know, you have your, your sort of piece where you're just like, you know, I can, your, your opinion of, I can, I can see why, but you know, you're just not a, you're not a fan. You can, you know, you can appreciate what he does on the mic and things of that nature. So I do like the, uh, I do like, we do have a sort of a counterpoint to, to that piece. Uh, the notion of, you know, kind of why maybe now and kind of how it was presented. I think it's one of those, it emphasized strongly your point about, all right, maybe this piece of John and, and Chris is kind of, that's the stamp, that's the statement that, okay, we're ending this, we're going to kind of move forward. And I think it was one of those things where it seems very likely with All Out being roughly three weeks away that this is going to sort of be the matchup world champion versus the interim champion the unification as it were so we how do we how do we sprinkle out how do we spread the storyline through the sort of three weeks of navigation of tv all right cool we have the emphatic statement punk return huge pop and the show again leave them wanting a little more little interaction boom we set up next week cool maybe we have a face-to-face -face. we get that promo right we get that sort of thing so Again, we, we mentioned it earlier in the show with uh, WWE, maybe like not force feeding or kind of shoving things down our throat, sprinkle in a little bit of the storytelling. I feel like this has its opportunity, maybe lends towards. Again, obviously we're building towards the all out uh, championship match. So I'm not, I'm not against it. We'll have the more story kind of come in. We'll have John and we'll have, uh, you know, a punk spar on the, on the mic. I'm sure at some point, within the next couple weeks, you know, we'll get that sort of payoff. But I, I kind of, I liked the, I like the sort of emphatic statement. And I did like the notion of, again, we're going to leave them wanting more, get a little taste. We're not going to give you everything right now. So I'm not mad at it. 
Yeah, look, and like, I understand CM Punk. I understand the character, and there are characters in this world that I do not like, but I understand them. And it's not because they're a bad guy or whatever. I perennially prefer heel, heel type characters because the individuals playing them have more fun than being structured around having to be a babyface. Um, you have characters who have been around the world, uh, like your Stone Colds, your Rocks, your CM Punks, who I would classify as the anti-hero. Like you said, the voice of the voiceless. These guys can walk that fine line of being the heel and face, be one or t'other, be both. I like that sort of style. I understand where he, uh, where he lies in the wrestling landscape. And I know what his strengths are. And I know uh, that an awful lot of people love him. All right. So those are, that is my disclaimer to my previous point. I didn't like this for the same reason that I don't like Roman Reigns having both belts. It's just the presentation. If you want me to believe Roman Reigns is supposed to be a big deal, make him be a big deal by shoving him down the throats of everybody, making him be a conceited heel, and having both those belts. Because at the minute, he diminishes the belts by not showing them, by not being presented, and by not existing. Punk coming out without the belt, without the microphone, diminished him to me and and honestly it should diminish him to everyone else because and this, this is this is my sort of opinion on it that he is the champion and we have had weeks of everybody ramming it down our throats that john moxley is the interim aew championship uh, title holder the interim this the interim that and jr famously going off on one i don't like this interim stuff like cool we get it Neither do I. So why don't we have the actual AEW title holder come down wearing the actual title belt? Making a point, standing at the top of the ramp and cutting a scathing promo, which you could have done on Dynamite. And yes, I get the sow the seeds, leave them wanting more. But this wasn't a cliffhanger to me like a Dexter Loomis or a Karrion Cross reveal was, because those were statements. Punk didn't do anything. Like, those statements had a purpose. They had shock value. Punk, his music hit, everybody lost their minds, and because it's Punk, they forgive the fact that he didn't do anything. He walked to the ring, looked at John Moxley, took the double fingers, and then John left. Holding his belt. Punk came down there and actually cleared out the JS from. Uh, Did he do John. anything to John Moxley? He didn't touch John, but that just, is my point. Just, just to reiterate, he helped clear out the JS from beating down Moxley and the Blackpool Combat Club. But his opponent is John Moxley. That is the point. He didn't do anything. And took the double finger. It's not as if, oh, this is, you know, this is supposed to be an honorable thing. Like, we know John likes to fight. John was holding the belt. He's the interim AEW world title holder. Punk is the actual, you know, like, come on. It's like, if you're going to ram this down our throat, present us with the person who's actually holding the belt, actually holding the belt. So quick that, question. Like, it, it just weakens him, in my opinion. Quick question for you. So the whole premise of his music hits, comes down, cleans the JS out, has the face-to-face -face with John. Would, would it have looked and felt different to you if he came down, like kind of with the belt in his hand, running down, again, maybe puts it down in the ring and then continues to clear house and then has the face-to-face -face with John, but he maybe picks it up and you have the picture of both of them 
maybe strap straps on their shoulders, straps in hand type of thing with the face off. Would that have looked and felt different for you? So that sequence of events, no. I don't want him to touch the JAS. I don't want him anywhere near that. JAS needs to go away from this entire segment. So JAS are cleared out. Okay. And then you have the BCC, you know, stood in the ring, stood tall, whatever they've cleared out, and you know, maybe John's the last one in the ring. And then you have Punk's music hit. Everybody loses their mind because John's alone. Like there's nobody else here. The music hits, Punk walks down struts with the belt in hand you know john's struggling to get to his feet with the belt because he's just had a bit of a a bit of a match where you know he's he's had to push himself cool punk just walks down holds the belt up john holds the belt up and then gets the hell out of the ring and punk standing tall as the title holder in the ring showing that yes his ankle is full there but he didn't do that. He came to the ring with no mic, didn't cut a promo. Like even if he had, even if he had a, you know, he didn't even have to cut a, a promo in, in my, in my example there. Like he just has to have the belt. He didn't do that. He didn't present himself contrary to the all the interim stuff we've been hearing. If your guys on the desk are told to be saying interim this, interim that. Go and buy your champion a toy from the toy store. Give him the belt from the toy store at the very least. Come on. Like, it just adds so much, especially with such an amazing belt. Like, so a little bit of me, that. Yeah. Sorry, to, to me, John's presentation here was better than CM Punk's. And not being a fanatic of Punk. That whenever Cult of Personality hits, I don't lose my mind every single time. Love the song. Love the entrance. Love everything about it. But because I'm not like, oh my god, I feel like I'm in the minority whenever I look at him and go, that could have been better. Or that was a bit too much. Like, don't get me wrong, super excited when he won the title. I, I love that he's back. I think that the fact that he has a passion for wrestling and is back is amazing. This isn't his fault. This is presentation. Got you. So it'd be more of a, a, almost a little callback to the second summer of Punk when after he won the belt at Money in the Bank, goes away for a month, and then that point maybe he just comes out wearing the, the WWE Championship, walks into the ring, holds it up, Cena then holds it up, show ends type of thing so exactly i wasn't even thinking of that but yes 100 percent. okay so a little bit different twist okay I, i'm totally seeing your point now okay fair enough i got gotcha. you so yeah i think there's always opportunities of like again you're you're seeing it with your sort of lens and your frame you know maybe i'm looking at it slightly different type of thing i think there's always and not to say that we're armchair quarterbacks, but there's always potentially things that we can be like little things that we can observe a little th- potential pieces we can pick out that could have been improved i do like your point of maybe again that that standoff piece where they both have the belts that's the statement in lieu of a a promo and things like that i would not have mind if i saw that i think i feel like that that sort of ending the show on that totally could have enhanced or maybe had a little bit more feel and then obviously the upcoming promos and the builds and the stuff like that for sure so i do like that notion good call yeah it's just that it adds more to punk's presentation and that that is kind of what we we've been going on with a lot of these individuals uh even returning individuals for wwe like it's all about presentation and him coming back having the best presentation let's face it like, <laughs> if your name is cm punk you get a five ten minute standing ovation the day after or the day you return you sit in the ring and like everybody's just clapping for what is it five ten minutes whenever he initially returned something like that yeah. um I legitimately had to fast forward through that. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, okay, everybody, I'm done. Uh, let the man speak. Um, so, I mean, his presentation has been up to now great and, you know, fantastic and all that there. But if you skip that beat that you've been building up, then it almost weakens him to a point of, well, I, I know now that on Wednesday he's going to come out with a belt. Like, we're going to hear a promo. Because if they don't, and here's the thing, if they don't bring out Punk, silly fly, if they don't bring out Punk with the belt and give him a promo, 
What was the point? Like, so we know he's coming back. But if he doesn't address the fact that he doesn't have the belt, then we're going to have John Moxley come out and go, well, I'm the real champion because I have the belt. And, you know, it's just it's just one of those things. Like, they got it wrong. AEW have had these little sort of bumps in the road uh, with the presentation of some of their individuals. Um, some, somehow they managed to mess this up for me. Gotcha. So I, I feel like it it's almost guaranteed. I don't think there's an official announcement, but I mean, like, I'm going to agree with you. There has to be, like, a punk promo on Wednesday. Because then again, mm-hmm. if... And if it's not on Wednesday or for even worse, the rampage for the Friday, like then kind of, yeah, what's the doesn't why bring them back? Yeah. yeah type of thing. So I, I, yeah, it definitely, it definitely kind of sort of has to happen. I agree with you. So, yeah. So why not give him that sort of like on the Wednesday, maybe we give him the opening promo where he calls out John Moxley standing in the ring, holding the belt, you know, <laughs> why couldn't that? Cause they've, they've shown that punk can open the show. And the ovation he would have gotten, like, I wouldn't have minded him coming back to open the show for five, ten minutes of clapping, you know, or, or five minutes of clapping, him sitting there with the belt, you know, calling out John Moxley, whatever it may be. Like, that five, ten seconds of him, you know, standing there and then nothing happening, cool. Like, it, yeah, it, it definitely could have been better presented, especially if uh, this is the lead up, the all out um, amalgamation or unification, unification match uh, that we're getting it all out. So not to, obviously that's feels like that's where we're leading it towards. And I'm Hmm. I'm sure in a further episode, we might do predictions and stuff like that. But what do you, are you, what are your thoughts on then potentially a punk and Moxley matchup? Then what are you feeling? What are your vibes at? Yeah, that that's difficult. Like it, it is difficult because Punk won and then went away. Like you can't, you can't exactly say that John Moxley's not worthy to hold the title, though. I, I'm glad I'm not Tony Khan. Like this is, I know that I love to play uh, armchair Booker, and I uh, and I pretty much fantasy book everything I see, but. That is one thing that I do not envy Tony Khan in the slightest. I feel like should the match happen at All Out, it will upset a lot of people. The result will upset a lot of people either way. Um, my gut reaction right now, Punk retains. Punk unifies the titles. Uh, because he never um, never defended the title. He didn't. They didn't vacate the title. And this is his first match back. I feel like if they were going to keep it on Mox, they would have had Punk vacate immediately and come back to uh, to struggle to fight Moxley and then maybe win it that way. But that's my gut reaction right now. Yeah. And that is me coming off of 10 minutes of bashing CM Punk. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, you'd really never know what you get with me. Uh, but I can tell you it's always going to be absolute chaos. And that's why I'm glad I'm not Tony Khan. Yeah, for sure. I am kind of looking forward to it because, again, they've squared off a couple of times in WWE 10 or so years ago. But, you know, it's a fresh matchup. These guys are at different points in their lives and their careers. And they're presented kind of differently as well. So again, with it seemingly leading towards Punk versus Moxley looking like it all out, I'm just excited for the match and I'll I'll lend credence to you that it's gonna be tough and to sort of pick a definitive winner against the two because John has definitely held his own and and you know been prominent on TV and and made the title feel important and taking on numerous contenders and things like that. So and then yeah, in all fairness, we Punk got injured right after he won it. So I'm, you know, I'm just looking forward to kind of how the match will play out and type of thing. So if we do indeed get it, so you're skirting the issue. Who you got though? Need your reaction. Who you got? I don't even know. I I feel like again, since Tony didn't vacate the title off Punk, I feel like he's going to continue to hold it. You know. Yeah. 
That is just, the exact same thing. Yeah. Just because, again, he didn't, he won it and, and immediately was just away. So, and that's not a knock on John, but I, if uh, at the moment before all the, all the build and all the things and all the promos and all these different pieces, like, yeah, I feel like Tony might have a special place for Punk at the moment. So, yeah. And that's yeah, never yeah. a detriment to John and what he's been doing since mm. Punk stepped away. Not at all. Yeah, no, I think I think the John taking the title and elevating it uh, like he has done has been an unexpected treasure um, that uh, Tony wasn't expecting to happen um, nearly as well as it has. Uh, matches that John has had, the um, defenses uh, that he's had have been arguably better than the hangman run i'm sorry to say you know like okay. the hangman run for me but fell a bit flat and that's why the cm punk run has such high expectations and it never happened so it's kind of got to happen so that's kind of where my head's at with the the uh the cm punk uh unification at least in this regard if the match is to happen this is us expecting it to happen and uh probably hoping it happens with things looking like that's the direction we're heading into, I can probably guarantee one thing is that we'll get some color in that matchup for sure. Yeah, we are going to get color and we're going to get it quick. And honestly, I think both men are going to be uh, pretty drained by the end of it. Yeah, so those are our impressions of Punk returning. feel like we maybe wanted it to go slightly different and... You know, either way, we both agree that it's going to be a hell of a matchup if it indeed does happen. So you let us know what your thoughts on the Punk returning and the potential matchup against Moxley at All Out. And definitely let us know down in the comments below and or on Twitter or Instagram. All right, coming up to Quick Hits. Uh, Again, for some of the newer listeners, Quick Hits are little moments that happen throughout the week that we may not have gotten an opportunity to cover full-fledged in the show proper, but we had the uh, little pieces that we enjoyed or sort of pop the boys segments that we wanted to share with you that we found we wanted to highlight here. So I'll start us off here. My quick hit. This comes from this past week's episode of Friday Night Smackdown. We saw Shinsuke Nakamura making his way to the ring for his matchup against Gunther for the Intercontinental Championship. We see Shinsuke uh, decked out in an amazing gold and black jacket, and I'm thinking to myself, where have I seen this before? And then it dawns on me. Shinsuke, of course, paying homage and cosplaying as the gold Zeo Ranger, which of course was played by Jason Scott Lee, the original red Mighty Morphin Power Ranger. (laughs) Little did we know, Shinsuke is a big Power Rangers mark. (laughs) I don't know about so are you. you, apparently. There we go, baby. I don't know about <laughs> you, but you it. I made the connection. What about you? What were your thoughts when you I saw Shinsuke? I did not make this connection, no. I, I did not make this connection at all. Um, really, really good. Pointing it out. Fantastic. I did not know this about Shinsuke. I did not know this about you. Um, yeah. Funny. Great job. Yeah, I was just like spitting image when I saw his entrance jacket. I'm like, what? Like in my it, as your brain starts to percolate, and it's like, why is this? Like, what is going on? And it dawns on me. I was like, oh yeah, Jason, Gold Ranger. Heck yeah, let's freaking go, dude. <laughs> yeah, I just I just remember the original primary color Rangers, and that's about it. <laughs> I don't know anything about any Gold Zeo Ranger. Yeah, so if. Uh, for me specifically, like this sort of happened when I was kind of in my childhood and this kind of came on here and I was familiar with, I guess, the uh, the first iteration, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and that ran for like three seasons or something, roughly 93 to 95-ish or so. Um, and then kind of when they sort of traditionally did the sort of the Japanese uh, piece with new seasons and they just rotated the cast out and things of that nature, like I think that's kind of just sort of when my age and, and kind of group, I just sort of fell off and just didn't have an opportunity to watch like type of thing. But 
yeah, it was one of those things I was like, oh, I just happened to be familiar sort of with the original cast and kind of things like that. And it's sort of like kind of the memories of that. So when I noticed that, I was like, something here. That was sort of maybe like the last kind of memory of Power Rangers for me ended up. And I was like, oh, Shinsuke doing the old uh, Power Rangers thing. So heck yeah, let's go. I mean, I, I do love whenever uh, whenever entertainer these entertainers come out and they cosplay as different things. Like we've seen it with Ricochet doing some My Hero Academia stuff. Um, but this is definitely one I did yeah. not catch. Yeah. Ricochet um, did like a Nightwing so, uh, type yeah, of thing. Yeah, he's, he's done he's done a lot. He loves superheroes, obviously, because him you know, being compared to being a superhero, yeah. uh, he has done an awful lot. Like his All Might one was my favorite, honestly. But this this Shinsuke doing a Power Rangers uh, went completely over my head. Thank you very much for pointing it out. Brings a smile to my face now. <laughs> it's actually, uh, I'm going to have to go back and uh, see if I can go. Oh, yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> yeah, definitely kind of. When I saw that, I was like, oh, there's something, something to this. And then when I kind of figured out, I was like, yes, there it is. So that was my, uh, brought a smile to my face, like you said. And it's kind of my pop the boys moment. And I definitely wanted to share that because I had got a kick out of that. Nice. But uh, that was mine. So uh, Joker, do you have any quick hits from this week? This week, I feel like I've been a negative Nancy a wee bit too much. Uh, you know what, with the things falling flat for me. So no, I don't have a quick hit. Um, there was a couple of nice little, uh, nice little points through the week, but nothing to the level of the gold Zeo Ranger, I'm afraid, PT. It's all good. You know, again, it's one of those where if we just happen over the course of just watching some wrestling this week, that we notice a little something that kind of makes us smile or kind of made us pop and like, Hey, type of thing. It's always that there's going to be a week sometimes where we may not have something or we might have a couple type of thing. And like I said, we had a lot of sort of returns or kind of things that we were sort of interested in that we may have talked about earlier, but I wanted to highlight this little piece. And, you know, sometimes, like I said, we, these were, this was a genuine thing for me. And again, we want to have a little bit of authenticity. And if it's not sort of forcing or kind of something just for the, the show type of thing, then I'd rather us sort of enjoy it and share the things that we like than kind of have a forced yeah. perspective as if you will. Exactly. If it doesn't get a if it doesn't get a hearty belly laugh out of me, then it's not going to be a quick hit. Uh, I, feel, I feel like last week, you know, people saw that I was struggling to get through my quick hit with Tori Yano and Lance Archer. That's the kind of level of quick hit pop the boys kind of motion we're going for. If it makes you laugh, if it makes you clap, you know, like and you just sat there by yourself and just clapping like a goon at the screen, like that's the kind of thing that we want, and that's the kind of thing that I love in. Uh, in my pro wrestling from WWE to the G1 to NJPW and, and AEW and everything. So yeah, definitely give me more of it. Uh, brings a smile to my face and I don't seem like such a bad guy whenever, you know, I'm not ragging on CM Punk. And may I just add like the piece about your last week's quick hit about the whole Toriano and Lance Archer matchup. I didn't get a chance just to watch it over the course of the week. But when I got a chance to kind of sit down and, and check it out and then edit it together, I absolutely loved the matchup and I loved your point and I absolutely got on board with it and I got a kick out of it. So something so something that you watched that you enjoyed that I just mm -hmm. didn't get an opportunity to that I got to then check out because of your suggestion made me really enjoy it too um, and kind of hit the story beats and hit the notes that you were saying. So definitely I appreciate that you kind of uh, showed me or you turned me on to something like that so definitely appreciate it so and that's kind of what we we do is that maybe the little things that we see and that we like maybe you can also get a kick out of them definitely because as much wrestling as we watch you know trying to catch it all we might miss something that might have popped you and if if something popped you that didn't pop us because you know we weren't paying attention or it flew over our heads like with the the gold zeo ranger this evening gotta let us know because you know we, we could we could easily go ahead and look at that and and pay more attention and feature that as well so definitely keep your eyes open uh and uh yeah just let us know in the comments below for sure couldn't have said it better myself so feel free if you liked ours and if you have more definitely agree with joker and let us know for sure All right, so that about wraps it up for us. We went over a lot today, man, and uh, it was uh, it was intense, but we had some really good conversation. How was it for you, dude? 
Yeah, it was good. Definitely got a lot of my negativity out. <laughs> I feel like I've, I've cleansed the negativity of this week's wrestling. I'm ready to go into next week with a positive mindset. <laughs> it Hopefully. was just it's just so hot out right now that we're not feeling kind yeah, of the greatest, is that? Yeah, that's it. I'm just complete like I'm I'm almost out of water here, you know. It's it's actually kind of warm now that I put my hand to it. So, yeah, it's definitely just the heat making me into a cranky man. That's all good, man. Like I like I said, it's it's a lot kind of happened and a lot's going to happen and we're we're planting seeds, but I did. We I like I like the point when we're not always agreeing 100% and we're not cuz again, mm. you you have uh, your sort of your observations and your kind of backgrounds and your likes that some some are similar with mine, some are different with mine. So I do like when we can have not necessarily an argument but we can have a sharing of ideas that are different and we can kind of be like oh okay i'm seeing your point now i didn't i didn't notice that i didn't see so yeah sometimes especially for me like if if i make a point i don't complete that point and you say something then you know you you add to me going oh well actually my point is this this is the point i want to make and having that conversation with someone else definitely broadens out what each of us have as an opinion towards whatever it is and our opinions change, our opinions may not change, but you know, we, we have that discourse and uh, it's always fun because otherwise you just kind of sat there watching it and then you have to listen to wrestling Twitter and hate yourself for <laughs> for a long year on there. Definitely a good thing about social media is everyone has a voice. Bad thing about social media is everyone has a voice. Everyone has a voice, yeah. But, yeah, regardless, we're all sharing our thoughts, and we appreciate uh, you listening to some of ours, myself, uh, Pretty Tony, as well as Joker's thoughts. And maybe you agree, maybe you disagree, but we're we're just here to share perspective and maybe uh, educate a little bit and provide a little bit different side of the story. And um, just basically spite an awful lot of nonsense about uh, nonsense on the internet anyway. 100%. So with that, for TF Joker. Stay hydrated, folks. I know I'm going to try to be. And for me, Pretty Tony, we thank you for your time. And let us be a part of the day. And remember, be good to yourself, be good to each other. And we'll catch you next time. Peace.